Hey guys, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome to yet another Mortal Kombat video. Now, in today's Who the Hell installment, I thought that we could do a little bit of an unorthodox character for this one episode, and it will be a none other than the very first guest character in MK's history, the God of War himself, Kratos. Now, before we jump into what made Kratos so unique in the world of Mortal Kombat, let's actually talk about the ghost of Sparta himself. But before most of you knew him, before he was busy tangling himself up in the likes of Midgard and bringing on the likes of Ragnarok, Kratos himself was born in Greece, more specifically the southern part of Greece known as Sparta. Now for those of you who are unfamiliar with Sparta's customs, the children of Sparta were raised in what could only be described as boot camps. Brought up as soldiers from the day they were born, Spartans were bred for war, and this was something that Kratos would not only succeed in, but really thriving through bloody combat, war and death. Kratos became a fierce general in the Spartan army. His legend spread so far throughout the land that it would even catch the attention of the gods. Now, despite his very harsh exterior, Kratos' heart remained in the hands of his wife and daughter. They served as a somewhat physical manifestation of his heart and his soul, and it's really here where Kratos could be human. But this would all quickly fall to ruin. One day on the battlefield, Kratos' Spartan army eventually fell to the likes of an endless barbarian horde. In one last act of defiance, Kratos swore a life of subservience to the god of war, Ares, in exchange for the defeat of the barbarians. Now, with Kratos' name having become legend, Ares would lunge at the opportunity to have the Spartan serve under his thumb. And in one full swoop, the barbarians were defeated, and Kratos was now a puppet of Ares. From here, Kratos would travel across the land, spreading the word of Ares' power by drawing the blood of both the guilty and the innocent. Eventually, Kratos would be lost in this haze of crimson, but Little did he know he had been played. Ares, having wanted to strip Kratos of his humanity, had the soldier unknowingly stormed the village of his wife and child, and lost in his berserker rage, had murdered those he had loved. After committing this ultimate sin, the oracle of the village would curse him, with his skin now marked white by their ashes. Thus, Kratos would be dubbed throughout the land as the ghost of Sparta. With his ties to humanity now affected effectively severed, Kratos went on a personal mission to bring down Ares, although he would bind his time in order to do so. In due time, the God of War's own appetite for destruction had spun out of control, as it did lead to a huge attack on Athens. Having caught the attention of Zeus as well as the rest of the Pantheon, Kratos would be tasked with the mission by Athena of killing Ares. But this was no simple feat, as he had to travel to many lands, and even a titan to obtain what would be known as Pandora's box. Upon opening its contents, Kratos was not only able to match Ares, but eventually overpower and kill him, in turn becoming the new god of war. But Kratos' journey is far from over. Whilst part of the pantheon now, he begins to learn more about not only the gods, but himself. During the events of the second game, there is a lot of turmoil and tension between him and his fellow gods. He doesn't follow their every word and rule. And because of this, it sparks outrage in Zeus, who does attempt to kill Kratos, who just narrowly avoids the jaws of death. From here, the Spartan fights his way through the afterlife and eventually returns to the world of man. But during another confrontation with Zeus, this time with Athena at his side, he learns that he isn't just a god of war, he is in fact a son of Zeus. Now, feeling like all gods were the same, he did attempt to strike his father down with an extremely powerful weapon known as the Blade of Olympus. This is unfortunately stopped by Athena, who instead deflects the blade into herself. It's here where she explains that 
If Zeus dies, so does the world itself. But hellbent on destruction and vengeance, Kratos summons forth the titans of old to battle Olympus. This of course re-sparks their war from eons ago. But as expected, these plans would quickly fall apart. Blinded by his own rage once again, Kratos would be betrayed by the titans. But like a great pendulum, Kratos comes swinging back, killing the likes of, and counting by the way, Poseidon, Hades, Gaia, Helios, Hermes, Hercules, Kronos, and finally Zeus himself. Of course, by doing so, Kratos has seemingly brought on the end of the Greek pantheon and the world itself. At least, the world that is perceived by the game at this time as atonement for his sins. Kratos plunges the blade of Olympus deep in his chest, hoping for the sweet embrace of death. But this is not quite a luxury the ghost of Sparta can afford, as we all do know he drifts from Mount Olympus to the land of Pharaohs and finally Midgard. Now, as much as I want to crack at God of War's somewhat reboot sequel, as it is a narratively interwoven spectacle, I'm not going to touch it for two reasons. You should absolutely go and play it for yourself, as it really is something you should experience, and this somewhat rebooted and new version of Kratos has no bearing or influence on the Kratos we do have in Mortal Kombat 9. Thus, I would be wasting your time. Now that said, go play the game or stick around, because I have a lot to say about Kratos' inclusion in Mortal Kombat 9. Whilst Kratos was the first guest character, to have ever been included in a Mortal Kombat game, he has sadly been forgotten over the course of time, having slipped through the cracks, but why was this the case? Well, shortly following 9's release, we got official details of its DLC plan, with the inclusion of the likes of Scarlet and two returning fan favourites in the form of Rain and Kenshi. Along with this, we got the iconic slasher of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, Freddy Krueger. Now, little did any anyone know that Kruger's involvement in 9 would not only bring forth an army of horror icons for X, I believe this is what largely overshadows Kratos' inclusion. Freddy's influence sparked a wave of old age characters that I largely feel eclipses Kratos' involvement. What didn't actually benefit the God of War is that he was PlayStation exclusive, meaning that roughly only half the fanbase had access to this character. Now on paper, this doesn't seem all too bad, right? But Kratos' exclusivity would actually hinder the character's exposure in every sense of the word. You see, on the competitive circuit, Kratos would in fact be banned due to his exclusivity, and actually because of Kratos being exclusive to PlayStation, the tournament standard for Mortal Kombat 9 would be 360. So Kratos would tragically get kind of dragged from the public eye from half the fan base as well as the competitive circuit of Mortal Kombat. With that said, however, how did Kratos play in game? Well, Kratos, whilst not bundled up with some of the broken high tiers of Mortal Kombat 9, was actually pretty damn unique, but not just to the world of guest characters in MK, but MK as a whole. Whilst yes he had your typical four button layout, Kratos' entire moveset was actually influenced from his tools in God of War 3. Kratos had strings that would extend across the screen, showing what the Blades of Chaos were capable of. Along with this, what made Kratos unique to this day is that he had elements of a charge character. What I mean by this is that you had to hold back two to get a cinematic launcher that would lead to an ender. If you didn't hold down the button, back two would simply become a launcher. Now Kratos' specials are really where he shined, because he once again took influence from his own game. Now, Kratos' specials are the following. Apollo's bow, a multi-firing projectile, the head of Helios, where, yes, he actually just yanks out a head from behind him and uses it to blind his opponent so he can, in fact, extend his combos. His next tool is the Hermes Dash, a quick side-switching special that is typically used for block pressure, as you could cancel the dash itself, Golden Fleece, which functioned as a parry and and of course, another callback to God of War 3, and his final special move, which is 
definitely my favourite is Zeus's Rage. This was a special move that once initiated, would start up a quick time event where upon pressing the right sequence of buttons, Kratos would pull out the blade of Olympus and plunge it into the back of the enemy. Another tool that we see is the Gauntlet of Hercules, where after stabbing the opponent with the blade, he would hit them with a haymaker to the skull that sends them across the screen. Now sadly the gauntlet would only be used in his x-ray as well as one of his fatalities, but it doesn't really stop right there with Kratos. The final thing about Kratos that makes him so unique to the MK universe is the fact that he's the only DLC character to date that has his own stage. This, as expected, is of course a callback to the God of War series, setting up the climactic battle between Kratos and Zeus. Now beneath the stage's grandiose design is actually where the stage really does shine. The stage itself has unique stage fatalities. Upon an Initiating the input, the opponent would be given three options to kill the enemy. One by incineration, one by decapitation, and one where they're just completely crushed. It's very unique in the MK series, and one that is understandably fitting of the God of War. Now, with this out of the way, why is Kratos so unique to the realm of Mortal Kombat, as well as him being a guest character? Well, really, if we think about it, especially when we take into account the other guest characters we've had. Kratos fits so unbelievably well into the MK universe. In a series where blood, gods, and carnage does thrive, Kratos is one of those characters that encompasses the values of the series. What complements his inclusion in Mortal Kombat 9 is just how many tools that have been implemented all the way over from God of War 3. My only real regrets from this is that the quality of character choices didn't quite stay up to snuff. So the big question now is, could we possibly possibly ever see Kratos return as a guest character because Let's face it, a lot has not only changed with the character, but the series as a whole since 3. Well, tragically no. As much as I want the next wave of guest DLC characters to be video game characters, Kratos' tragic and main crutch is that he's a console exclusive character, so it would once again be a case where the fanbase would be split in half due to consoles. Yeah, they probably could do a thing where he's a mascot for PlayStation 5 and Xbox probably gets the Master Chief or one of its mascots. But we also do have to remember, esports have really become a big thing with NRS games over the last two installments. So I don't think the chances of console exclusive characters really being possible at this point in time, especially seeing as both consoles are still competing against each other after their problematic launch. With that said, this has been it for who the hell is Kratos. I hope you have enjoyed this video and learnt more about his inclusion in Mortal Kombat 9. I really do feel like he's a very unique character in the universe of MK with his phenomenal toolkit. Sadly, he is most certainly drowned out by the likes of the guest characters of MK. X, who I would say are arguably the best wave of DLC characters the series has produced. I just really really do hope that going forward we do get more characters like this, ones that feel loyal to this genre and ones that can incorporate something that's completely unique to the series from a completely different subgenre. So with this episode now wrapped up, I have a question for all of you. What video game character would you like to see in MK? please do comment down below. And just before we do finish up things here, quick reminder that there will be more God of War stuff featured on this channel going forward. With the PlayStation 5 preview next week for new games, we could get some new interesting news regarding Ragnarok and everything surrounding the next installment in the series. I also have a history of Kratos planned right now, along with my next big project, God of War Making the Monster. But that will be done when it is done. So before this video does wrap up guys, if possible let's try getting it to about 500 likes and please do not forget to subscribe and tick that bell as it will keep you up to date with all of my content going forward and as you can tell i've got a ton of plans in place but for now as always please comment like subscribe and share this video with everyone you know please take care and i will see you all next time